Well, a very warm welcome to this Education Policy Institute Publishers Association webinar on the subject of making education recovery uh, accessible to all. I'm David Laws, the chair of the Education Policy Institute, and I'll be chairing the discussion that we're going to have today. Uh, and thanks to all of you for favouring us over the competing attractions of round two of the uh, competition for the next uh, prime minister, which I think is is uh, ongoing, but uh, probably ongoing for quite some time to come. So thank you for, for joining this event. It's actually the third in a series that the Education Policy Institute has held in partnership with the Publishers Association. Uh, and it's covered the, the, the issues and areas that we're going to be uh, debating today. And at the end of these um, three separate events, we're going to try to pull together some of the discussion and thinking from these events in uh, a publication uh, that we will uh, be putting out and that will therefore be uh, available to all of those people, both who have been able to join us today and others who will want to see some of the results and thinking. Um, just to remind all of you, not least our panelists, some of whom uh, were on the previous events, that, that just to remind you that whereas those events were private events, this one is a public event. Uh, so everything that you say, say can be heard by those taking part and uh, can be also be considered to be uh, public. Uh, so just a, a word of uh, notice and caution on that. Um, the, the format today is we've got two debates, um, which we're going to involve the panel in, and then in both cases, open up uh, to questions from those of you who are listening in. So please feel free to put any questions as they come up into the chat. And then if we've got the time, which I hope we will do, I'll come to the uh, panelists and put some of the questions and any others that arise uh, to them. Um, after the first panel on the impact of the pandemic on inequality and how we uh, should support an effective education recovery, we will then be joined by Dame Rachel D'Souza, the Children's Commissioner for England. And Dame Rachel is going to speak, speak to us for uh, about 15 uh, minutes with, with some thoughts of her own. And we will then try to take some questions uh, from you um, on the contents of her uh, address before going into the second panel discussion. Um, and we will aim to finish no later than five o'clock, given the commitments that you and members of the panel have. So thank you again to the Publishers Association for making all of this possible. Thanks to those who have attended and particularly to our panelists. And we're now going to go over for the first of those uh, debates and discussions. So this is around what impact uh, the pandemic has had on educational inequality in England and how we should support effective education recovery, uh, particularly in the light of the uh, distribution of costs, um, educational and well-being costs from the pandemic. So I'm going to just introduce uh, in the order of their speaking, uh, each of the panelists, invite them to speak for four or five minutes, and then we'll take questions uh, at the end of that. And I'm delighted that our, our first, the first panelist I'm going to come to is Nicola Shipman, who also took, place, took part in one of the earlier roundtables that we held. Uh, many of you will know uh, Nicola, she's Chief Executive of the Steel uh, City Schools uh, Partnership um, based up, up in uh, Sheffield and she's an ideal person to kick us off on this issue of trying to assess the impact of the, of the pandemic and think about what we need to do to uh, ensure education recovery. So Nicola, thank you so much for being here and over to you for your comments. Thank you, David. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Yes, as David says, I'm, I'm Nicola Shipman. I'm CEO of Steel City Schools Partnership. We're currently a partnership of nine primary schools. We're working with a 10th school uh, or we're working with a, a school in, in the city of Sheffield. We serve quite a diverse demographic um, area. So some schools of particular challenge with 60% plus free school meals, high levels of sp uh, special needs and then some schools with lower um, disadvantage and send. So actually the, the impact of the pandemic across our schools has been varied, as I'm sure it is for, for colleagues in the room um, you know, on the call today. 
I suppose for me, thinking about the impact of, uh, of the pandemic, um, there are so many facets to, to, to what that means in terms of, um, you know, the educational experiences our children have had. Um, I suppose thinking most recently, this time last week, we were digesting our first set of results, for instance, since 2019. So obviously, you know, mindful that those of you who are primary colleagues will know that, you know, results, um, in, in aspects of, of uh, the end of key stage two results have declined um, other than in reading. Um, we have seen that trend. So uh, following, the, following the national trend, we've seen um, a particular decline in uh, children's standards of writing. But then schools have had a, a real focus um, in terms of reading and phonics. We've seen the trend in our schools and again, I think that mirrors thinking about the experiences our children had at home um, about the opportunities or the things that children were able to access um, through their remote learning education that, you know, those with the resources and the ability to access reading um, have um, had that sustained over time. But maybe those children uh, wanting to write um, and write across the curriculum um, hasn't been. I'll say a little bit more about outcomes later on. In terms of some other impacts that we've seen, clearly attendance has been a huge impact, but um, uh, I think for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, COVID itself and the lockdown um, impacted greatly on our school's ability to be open. We then served our vulnerable children, our disadvantaged and our SEND pupils, as many schools did. But then an ongoing problem with um, attendance is that anxiety. I think we've seen heightened social and emotional um, issues, not only with children, but with their families, about them being brought back into school, into larger groups, into their classes. Children, some children until earlier this year had only ever been taught in a bubble. They didn't experience some of those um, experiences that many of us with our own children have had, like the fir their first assembly, their first nativity, dining, you know, a dining experience where children in, in, in a whole school. So actually some of those childhood experiences, um, you know, two years worth for some children, we've had to do a lot of learning or a lot of routine building that we have probably historically taken for granted. So we've had to do a lot more of that with a lot more children who are normally older. And, you know, we all know that children in their early years, if you set them off with really, really good routines, those routines get embedded and then they don't become routines, they become the norm. So again, over certainly the last two years, we've had to do a lot of norming of routines because we've, we've not had to do them before. So, so something around uh, that as well. Um, in terms of um, uh, PA rates, so persistent absence linked to the attendance, what we're seeing as an ongoing impact of um, COVID, again, and I think this links back to um, anxiety in that social, emotional health and well-being, is an ongoing anxiety about attendance back in school and large groupings. So we're seeing a lag and particularly higher PA rates than, the, than we would have done um, uh, previously because of anxiety, particularly of families coming back into school. I've mentioned early years, um, I can't get away from the fact that I do think a, a particular cohort of children, early years, yes, particularly some of our youngest children, so um, many of our schools have nurseries, but we had children start school not having had preschool experience, so again, we have had to deal with children in our early years who were not toilet trained, um, who didn't have some of those very basic early skills because they had been at home. We have children coming into our nursery who have only ever been at home, so they've not even had a play group or a toddler group. So again, we're having to do a lot of work. So a, a real plea, and I, I know I've made this plea before, is to really think about the early years, because I think we've got some cohorts of pupils, some generations of pupils coming through school that we're going to have to think quite carefully about. Yes, we know over time those gaps will close but particularly um, for schools um, within our trust but also within our city but also schools that I know because um, you know I inspect as well but schools that are um, in challenging circumstances so maybe schools with higher numbers of special needs 
or higher numbers of disadvantaged, some of the gaps that they had closed over time have widened to even wider than they were previously. So we're going, we are having to do a lot of re-gap closing to get children to where they need to be. That brings us sort of background to, to the outcomes for pupils. So, you know, outcomes for many schools, um, you know, we've seen the, the, the national combined measure drop quite significantly this year. Um, and that is uh, understandable. Some of those skills that the children did have, um, they, they didn't have the skills at, at, by the end of this year to be able to pass the test that they did. Um, so again, I, I think we need to be mindful going forward about how we ensure those gaps um, the basic skills, particularly in writing, we found that, you know, that that constant repetition, it wasn't being repeated enough or undertaken enough within um, within. The, the, the lockdown period and then back into school. So that's something that we really, really need to focus on. But particularly for my schools uh, that face, uh, that, that are in certain um, parts of our city, finance as well and family circumstances. So our families, um, you know, haven't gone out of their home, haven't gone beyond the city and are facing quite significant financial hardship and challenge. Obviously, that is somewhat being exacerbated by the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment. So we are dealing as schools with a lot more than schools should be dealing with. So food banks um, directing families to financial aid, clothing aid, food aid, um, you know, basic things like, you know, you know, toothbrush, toothbrush, providing toothbrushes and toothpaste. So those very basic skills, hygiene skills that we need to make sure children um, are having and, and, and being able to access appropriately, that those families aren't disadvantaged. So um, a, a, a lot of aspects that, we, that we've struggled with. In terms of next steps, we need to carry on focusing on many of the things that I've said about how we close the gaps, how we improve attendance, how we, uh, you know, lower PA rates. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about, you know, how we can use the funding that is going to be coming our way um, to be able to identify very specifically for either specific families, specific children, specific cohorts or groups, what we need to do to reclose the gaps, to get the children to where they need to be at each milestone within the primary age phase. Nicola, that was great. Um, very comprehensive um, and a really good introduction to this discussion. I'll save some of the questions until the end of our four speakers, but um, before, before we bring um, Dan in, can I just ask you one follow-up question? Mm -hmm. You mentioned, you know, the first set of results that have come through quite recently at a national level. Can you say a little bit about how varied those results were by school and by pupil and whether any variation, you know, followed fairly predictably from attendance or deprivation issues or whether there were any surprises in there about what, mm -hmm. you know, who was losing out in, in which schools and which types of children? Yeah, so so our initial analysis has shown that our most our schools <clears throat> in our most deprived areas, so those with higher numbers of pupil premium, disadvantaged or SEND, have got the lower results. Um, their gaps have widened. So when we've looked at progress, they have made less progress. Their gaps have widened. Um, because they've maybe not um, had the opportunities um, during the lockdown period. And also many of those have lower attendance because of parental anxiety, mental health issues, those sorts of things. So yes, it, it, the pattern very much follows um, that those families facing most disadvantage, their pupils' outcomes are further away than um, we would like them to be. Similarly, you know, what we have found is that a real focus that we've had, um, particularly in the last year, year and a half, 18 months on early reading and phonics, actually some of our phonics and early reading scores are better um, than we thought they might be, which shows that a real focus on that within the curriculum has actually paid dividends. Hence, I think the improvement seen in reading as well. Okay, so, that's very, oh, sorry, Nicola, we're gonna add something. No, no. Great, that was really useful. And we might come back to some of the other issues uh, after we've heard from other panelists. But 
Uh, I'm now going to bring in Dan Conway, uh, who is the um, Chief Executive of the Publishers Association. Dan, delighted to have you here today. You, I think you're just taking over as Chief Executive, by the way, uh, in the next few days. So congratulations on your uh, new appointment and over to you. Dave, <clears throat> David, thank you very much. And I just want to say a huge um, thank you to EPI for running this programme. You've been absolutely brilliant and um, uh, working with you has been an absolute, an absolute pleasure. Um, Catch up is an area that my members are thinking a lot about. Um, we run an education publishers council and, and, and where we bring all of our education publishers together. And catch up is a, a, a topic which we um, try to talk about together and think creatively about how to tackle. But we're very aware at the Publishers Association that we're a very small part of a much, much wider pie. And of course, uh, we would say that um, publishers have a role to play here. And we think we do have a role to play here. Um, but really, our strong belief is that catch up in this country should be teacher centric and school centric. Teachers know best what to do with their um, individual pupils and their individual classes and catch up for one group of kids. As we've just heard from Nicola, is going to be very, very different to the um, catch up needs of another. And <clears throat> I think that's really the point that I wanted to make uh, today is that we strongly feel that teacher aut autonomy and school autonomy um, are really the things that are going to help us tackle the catch-up problem. Um, there is no one-size-fits-all um, uh, panacea to solving it. Um, and incidentally, that's why we think um, the, the department's curriculum body, um, which, which, which is in nascent form at the moment, is, is um, I'm afraid, going in the wrong direction because um, the curriculum body is looking to procure full sets of learning resources, um, across the piece, and we think it is, uh, it, it's a sledgehammer, um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not wanted by teachers, and also it's going to harm the commercial resources market. Um, and so we don't think that a, um, a, a, an intervention like that will work and will help catch up. What we think will help catch up is giving the teachers and the schools the, res the resources and the funding that they need to be able to bring in proper differentiated solutions to the catch up needs of the students that they, they are facing. And that's what we feel that the commercial market offers. The commercial market offers a series of, um, of catch up resources from back to school guidance to bespoke tutoring to uh, you know, revision guides, but, but really importantly, there's choice on the market. Mm -hmm. Teachers can decide whether they pick up a Pearson or we'll hear from Vivek from Oxford University Press in a minute, uh, an OUP, uh, product or they can choose not to. The, the answer we do not think is to have a one size fits all set of catch up resources for every student in the country. And we're worried that that's the, that's the direction that the department's taking at the moment. Okay, so you, Dan. Uh, Dan, that was great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and we're now gonna hear from uh, Graham Archer. Uh, Graham, we're delighted to have you with us today. I know you joined for one of the other round tables as well, Graham. Uh, who will be known to many of you, is now the Director of Disadvantage and Place Strategy um, at the DfE. Um, Graham, very keen to hear uh, from you uh, on, on these issues. Thank you. Rookie error. You would think after two and a half years, I would be uh, up for uh, unmuting myself. Um, thanks, David. I'm uh, Graham Arch, as you say, and as well as being currently director of place uh, and disadvantage strategy, uh, I was until April director of education recovery in the department. So um, speak from that perspective too. Um, I thought I'd do try and do uh, four things. Uh, say a tiny bit about um, the evidence and what we see about disadvantage. And then I thought being a compliant sort of bloke, I would try and answer the sort of questions that you put in the uh, um, in the agenda and in the and in the chat and and use that as a, a prism to um, uh, see some of this. Um, so I mean, first thing to say is I agree very much with uh, a, an awful lot of what Nicola said about what uh, has been seen um, and and the results this last couple of weeks um, fit very well with the evidence we've had from. Um, the work that um, EPI with Renlearn have been doing for uh, the department and indeed other, other studies. So we are seeing all children um, further behind at this point than we would expect in 
um, or after a what you might call normal period. Um, we are seeing that most strongly in maths, but to some extent in the uh, writing and grammar type territory, much less strongly in reading. Uh, we are seeing it more strongly, or at least we're seeing weaker catch up is probably the right way of putting it in secondary than in primary. Uh, we are seeing uh, disadvantaged children uh, slipping further behind, uh, and we are seeing a divide uh, based on geography, um, some of which is linked to disadvantage, some of which is um, a sort of broadly, uh, though it's more subtle than this, a north-south divide with uh, pupils in the north um, catching up a little less slowly. Uh, and I agree strongly with uh, Nicholas' points about the importance of uh, attendance and getting that picked up uh, and um, around the importance mm -hmm. of the years and that group in particular. Um, so, I mean, that's a backdrop, which is a sort of not a great picture, really, is it? It's an improving picture in some areas, um, but overall uh, not as good as we would want it to be. Um, and the first question you asked was, was, nonetheless, what is there coming out of the recovery process which might be of benefit um, to children in the longer term? Um, and I suppose the first thing that I would say is that schools understanding recovery and those schools that do this best are doing it really well uh, must be of help for um, disadvantaged children and other children who need extra and targeted support uh, going forward uh, and that sense of thinking about targeted support uh, in the round is one that comes uh, through in the recent um, schools white paper around the parent pledge and around the sort of targeted support uh, chapter. Um, I think the improvements in remote uh, learning and in sort of digital education um, have been a significant help too, both in terms of you know, the hardware. There are, no, there are further two million laptops in schools that weren't there previously. Um, Dan will be unsurprised to know that I disagree with him about um, the um, usefulness of um, the Oak National Academy and the new curriculum body, where I think there have been some powerful uh, materials produced. Um, I mean, you're right, they shouldn't be produced exclusively and schools required to use them. That's not what we're saying. Um, but I think, you know, free, high quality resources are a really important tool for schools to use. Uh, I think tutoring is really important uh, and will be a permanent intervention. Um, um, you know, tutoring along the preserve of um, the better off and used, you know, to support in passing particular um, uh, exams, either at 11 or at, at 16. We hope to see that as being an intervention for those who need it uh, most. Um, and I think the use and innovations that arise out of the um, recovery premium and the catch up premium before that and particularly the evidence base, which we increasingly want to deploy um, to make that happen. So, I mean, I agree that teaching is absolutely critical, but I also agree that, I also think that evidence is, and I think the support for another 10 years of the Education Endowment uh, Foundation is a really important uh, thing coming out of the uh, pandemic too. Um, but I do think teaching is important. And I think the extra funding for you know, teacher training in schools, um, training too in early years um, is absolutely, um, you know, critical and will be a benefit, you know, going forward. In some ways, it'll be a more benefit going forward than it is in the very um, short term. So uh, all of that's uh, important. Um, I'll be quick on the last two questions. The second one was about accountability. And I suppose my view in short is that um, it's right to hold schools to account for their recovery as for every other aspect of their business. And in a sense, recovery is their business, isn't it now? Um, and I think there are three important elements to that. I mean, Nicola talked um, compellingly, didn't she, about you know those schools in your trust that are doing well, those that are not doing so well, and how you bring that together and use that evidence to improve across the piece. So I think accountability within uh, multi-academy trust is important. Uh, Ofsted um, critical and Ofsted as a means of 
supporting and driving improvements. And I think parents are important. Parents demanding a lot and looking for uh, catch up, which brings me in 30 seconds onto the last uh, element, which is what can parents and uh, the community do? Um, clearly, the home learning environment is critical, uh, isn't it? And that's one of the things that has perhaps exacerbated the gap between those who are disadvantaged or not. So emphasize the importance of working with your children and um, putting that at the heart of the way you interact with them. Um, I think, again, be demanding of schools. Um, and I think the parent pledge in the white paper is a real uh, vehicle for uh, doing that. Um, and I think the final thing that I would say is about the wider community. It speaks to Nicola's point about well-being and anxiety and the absence of a sort of socialization uh, of a group of children. And I think there are lots of organizations in the community, whether they be uh, you know, sports clubs or music related things or any number of others uh, that can play a really, really powerful role. I think none of that should um, should detract from the central role of schools. And my last point is that what I think the pandemic has shown really, really clearly is how critical in-class face-to-face teaching is, because that's the point at which um, things have slipped back. And however good remote learning is, uh, it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, substitute for that. Uh, so in that, that sense, I think, you know, Dan and I are very much on the same page. It's about teaching. It's about being in school. Uh, and it's about the quality and evidence with which you um, bring your toolkit to bear uh, in schools. Uh, thanks very much. Graham, that was great. And you covered a lot of territory in a short period of time. We've already had some questions come in about various things that the panellists have mentioned today, including uh, your area, Graham. But I'll leave some of those questions until we've had our final uh, panellists brought in. Our final panelist is Vivek Govill, who is the Managing Director of um, Oxford University Press, uh, responsible for their, their education business. Uh, Vivek, thank you very much for being with us, and mm. over to you. Thank you, David. I, I actually took on this job during lockdown, so actually all that I've known about UK education has been lockdown and then recovery, so that's... Uh, um, but at at, at uh, OUP, we you know we 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 are constantly sort of doing strategic research to see what uh, how how schools and children are faring. One of our one of our big uh, pieces is a is a research we do into the word gap uh, pretty much every year, and we saw I mean you know even pre pandemic we were seeing the growing gap particularly as children were moving from primary to secondary uh, in terms of <clears throat> the gap in their vocabulary and. Uh, so we've seen, and, and obviously we've seen during the, during the pandemic, there's been a significant widening of that. But I wanted to talk about a few things, few sort of things that started to change during the pandemic that I think are potentially all positives. Um, I, you know, we've always sort of talked well-being, but I don't think, I think it was during the pandemic that, you know, actually it, it was the first thing that everyone was thinking about. And so that that significantly enhanced focus on well-being, I think, is fantastic. I think uh, it was a lot of schools and a lot of teachers. It was the first time that they were forced to use digital uh, solutions, and I think therefore there's been a much greater acceptance and the beginning of an understanding of where digital can help and where digital doesn't help quite so much. Um, there's there's been a much greater parental involvement. Um, I know that came with a lot of stress for parents during lockdown, but the fact is that they had to dive in. And uh, I think they've, there's indications that they, their involvement has continued at a higher level than, bef than before. And I think finally there's been, a, I think in the community, there's been a much greater realization of the value of schools and of teachers. Um, you know, I mean, I think all the parents who had to look up, particularly look after young children, were just so delighted when they could send their children back to school and they realized just how much pressure uh, teachers are under uh, constantly. So I think all of those are all of those are for you know good outcomes, if you like, from uh, good uh, trends from the pandemic. Um, moving forward, I think we um, what we're seeing is, uh, and I think Nicola may have mentioned this, but I mean we're seeing that the Schools with the greatest success are, are where they are in, instituting whole school solutions, particularly around phonics and some early language interventions uh, and stuff like that. So certainly that's a that's that's a big area. Um, 
when I was sort of researching a little bit for this webinar, you know, and you, you start looking at what are successful strategies for recovery, and you realize pretty rapidly that there are multiple strategies for recovery. And, you know, it depends. It, uh, I, I think Dan said it isn't one size fits all. It, it is, it, you know, uh, the solutions that work for one environment may not be completely appropriate for another. And actually just being able to trust teachers to teachers and schools to find the right solutions, I think is, uh, is really important. Um, and obviously, since I am with a publisher, I would say that that range of strategies uh, leads to the need for a range of resources and, uh, and, and actually being able to see which ones fit your strategies the best and being able to choose those. Um, so I do have to just reference Oak. Um, I think during the pandemic, uh, Grant, I, I, Graham, I'd completely agree with you that during the pandemic, what Oak National Academy did was fantastic and it was the need of the hour. Um, if you were to say, what's the need of this hour? It's probably not Oak National Academy. There's a, there are a lot of very underserved parts of the, of the education space and it would be fabulous if the arm's length body were to actually look at those underserved areas rather than sort of diving into an area which is actually probably the best served area of education uh, where there's plenty of high quality choice and uh, other things. So I, 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 I don't understand, I mean, I don't understand the logic and uh, I think it's probably, there's, there's a lot of value that the, that the department and the arm's length body can bring to schools I just think you've sort of chosen the wrong part to dive into. Um, but that's that's what I had to say to start off with, if that's okay. That, that was great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm now going to um, put to the panelists various questions that we've had coming in via different routes and some that also um, have occurred to me as, as I listened to your comments today. Um, Graham, I'm going to start with you. Um, one of the questions that uh, came in through our formal route is about the future of uh, tutoring post-2024, uh, post the period of time, I suppose, where, uh, where national funding will end. And, I and there's an understandable um, concern about whether schools will choose to and, and have the, the funding to continue uh, the, the tutoring activities beyond that. Um, what's your thinking about that issue, the long-term issue for tutoring? I mean, the first thing I'd say is that's the $64,000 question, isn't it? I mean, that's absolutely um, the key uh, to all of this. Our intention is that schools will see the value of tutoring while it's heavily subsidized uh, and see uh, the value of that to the extent that they will continue it as it becomes less and less subsidized and then not uh, subsidized and I think there's decent evidence for that I mean all the sort of public noise around tutoring has been around around stat and the contract and you know whether it's working or not in that sense but those schools who have used tutoring and you know we're now on track to get 1.9 million courses this year so it's you know it's most schools um say to us that the impact has been strong uh, and that they do see the value and they do see um the kind of catch-up um that um you know the theory of, of of tutoring would suggest i mean obviously that's not in every single case um, with every single tutoring organization, um, you know, but generally speaking, very strong support. And we'll get a sense of that, won't we, as as the taper goes down. So, you know, next year it's uh, it's 60% and it goes down, you know, significantly after that. So we'll be a bit ahead of the game for um, 2024. But I think, you know, the evidence such, such that it is, is good. Um, obviously, but you don't know is is what happens once the money uh, reduces. But um, certainly optimistic. Graham, thank you. I'm going to come to Nicola uh, next for a question about um, what's happened to the disadvantage gap uh, during this period of time. But but you did mention Graham uh, some of the data that the department has been collecting from various different sources, including the project that EPI and Renaissance Learning have been undertaking for the department. Um, and that I think has been really useful. It obviously hasn't been able to cover 
Key Stage 4 and beyond. Um, is there much data that the department has been able to collect uh, post Key Stage 3 to understand whether um, learning losses are uh, spread very, you know, similarly post primary, because we know quite a lot about primary and key stage three, but maybe not much about beyond that and probably and not much outside the sort of English and maths areas. Are you asking me that, David? Or yes, sorry, that, that was to you first, Graham. Um, I mean, you're, I, I mean, the short answer is you're right. We have much less evidence at key stage four than we do in the previous key stages. Um, and, and in a sense, the, the trite answer is um, that we'll have quite a lot more uh, after the summer uh, when we've, um, you know, a, a, a round of exams and a round of the national reference tests, um, the, the latter in, in being in particularly important in this context, uh, which we can draw on and get a sense of how that is um, pulling through to, um, uh, to key stage four. So yeah, you're right, lesser, lesser key stage four than other key stages, but hopefully we'll be in a stronger position before too long. Graham, thanks for that. And, and Nicola, I was going to almost put a similar question to you. Um, from your uh, own first-hand experience and from the work you've been able to do with other schools within the Sheffield area, um, what's your sense about where the biggest learning losses have been by phase? You've already talked about early years education. Um, and, you know, we know we know a reasonable amount about sort of reading and uh, maths and so forth and writing. Uh, but there's been very little national data on you know what's happening in geography and history and physics and everything. Should we assume actually that the learning losses in those subjects could be, greater than for you know English and maths because they are um, you know often less easy to engage in in a in a uh, lockdown environment I think that's a really interesting question there about about the wider curriculum in terms of I'll, I'll ask I'll answer the first part about different phases what I would say is I've mentioned early years, I'm not going to go over that again, but what I would say from my um, experience of my own schools, but again, as you said, working across the region, uh, we've seen probably the biggest hit in our year two cohort and our year three cohort. So our year two cohort um, uh, have seen some significant reductions. Again, they have not, they have not yet had a year that hasn't been interrupted by COVID. Um, in some way, shape or form. So we are, we are, the routines and things that I talked about, you know, they are a cohort that we've had to pay particular um, attention to. Our year threes as well, they were the last cohort that we had GLD data on. Um, so their key stage one experience um, has also been um, hit. So um, anecdotally, things like behaviour, attendance, um, those pupils with SEND, we are seeing those two cohorts through our schools, and I know with other schools I'm, I'm talking to, as being probably the most significantly hit. Our older cohorts, yes, we've, we, we've got data for them this year, but because they had learning routines and learning behaviours because they'd been into, in school for three or maybe four years, they were there. Yes, they needed to be brought back, but they could be brought back maybe slower than we would have liked. But at least they had learning behaviours and, and were able to apply themselves to how schools worked. It's those younger year two and year three, particularly from maybe a data perspective. In terms of um, your second question around the wider subjects, um, I, I think that's variable. I mean, I, I get an understanding. I, I know we have been as well working on our whole curriculum, our wider curriculum. And, you know, uh, thinking about the, the, um, the value that some of our schools um, communities play on uh, pay on English and maths. They were the subjects that they wanted their children to engage in during home learning and access through through their remote learning. Yes, they're priorities for us in school, but they were also priorities for us at, at, at home. 
Um, so they were more so they were more likely to engage in those activities than they were in maybe the history, the geography, the RE, the PSHE type of learning. I think what we've been able to do through our recovery curriculum and through the work that we've done is A, to ensure a broad and balanced curriculum, but where we've seen some of those anxieties or behaviours, I, I think we've seen children catch up much more excitedly and engage more with the wider curriculum areas like the geography, like the history, um, through the use of really good texts and um, through novels, whatever it might be, through experiences. So we've tried to think really creatively and carefully about how we can make sure, yes, we're doing the reading and writing and the maths, but bring those wider subjects back. So um, in terms of data, um, we, we don't provide data for those subjects, but certainly I would say that our, our headlines in terms of our point in time assessments would show that probably more of our children are where we would like them to be or, to, or are closer to where we would like them to be in some of those wider subjects, PE, art, design, those sorts of things, maybe than they are in the core subjects of reading, writing, phonics, um, if that makes sense. That's really helpful. Before I move on to, to ask Dan a question, um, can I ask you uh, another slightly tough one. Um, you mentioned about your gaps uh, between disadvantaged pupils and the rest being wider than before, which correlates with a lot of the data that's been collected elsewhere, including in the work we've done for DfE. Mm -hmm. um, what we've seen at a national level is quite a big giving back of the progress that's been made in closing the gap over the Absolutely. last decade. And that's been worse at secondary than primary. Um, does that, you said the gaps were wider than before. Um, are you generally thinking of, you know, that you've lost a number of years of progress uh, in gap closing, or are you thinking about they're even wider than they were 10 years ago? I mean, how worried should we be about this observation that the gaps have opened over COVID? I, I, and again, I'm, I'm just thinking particularly about my trust and some of the data analysis I've done on some of our particular schools and, and particularly those schools that serve the most disadvantaged contextually communities. Yes, I would say that some of those gaps are even wider than they were. I'm thinking about 2012 when we was first looking at the pupil premium funding and there was that DfE report on the use of pupil premium funding and closing the gaps. And, you know, it's taken... For, for some of us, a generation. So you think about 2012 to 19, seven years, that's the life of a primary child. And, you know, that was a school facing, you know, I've got a school in mind, that was a school facing particular challenges, but the gaps, you know, that, that school in 2019 had data that was above the national average in combined and in measures for children. That's that school's data, and I'm just using one example here now, but that school's data has gone back 30%. Yeah. So those gaps are even wider than wh where they were back in 2012 when we first started working with the school. Now, that is one school. We've got, you know, other schools. The gaps aren't as wide, but special needs, disadvantaged gaps have widened. If you've got special needs and disadvantaged, those gaps are even wider because they've got multiple vulnerabilities. So, yeah, some schools, I think, have really got some work to do. I absolutely understand as well that, you know, I hate to say that sort of north south divide, but I do think there is an element of that. We, you know, I'm serving a region that, you know, historically has got some weak data um, or weaker than national data. And we were really proud of the gaps that had been closed, but we now realize we've got some more work to do to get ourselves back to where we were back in 2019. Yeah, Nicola, that's. Um rather depressing, but still useful to, to be aware of. Uh, thank you. Um, Dan, on, on that issue that we've just heard about and that Nicola referred to earlier about variation, the variation of experience across the pandemic and that some schools and pupil types and mm. parts of the country have been particularly badly hit. Are you seeing through your members any really useful practice that's helping uh, with that targeting of the children who've who've really lost out we know that some parts of the country in some subjects there's almost been a complete uh, 
recovery of, of learning and things like reading in London for non-disadvantaged students. But, you know, if, if you've got the wrong characteristics in the wrong school in the wrong area, things look pretty grim. Are you seeing some good practice there that uh, we might learn about at a national level? So I think I think what we're seeing, and I think Nicholas um, uh, um, uh, articulated this incredibly, incredibly well in her in, in, in her most recent comments. There is just the scale of the challenge and, the, and and how different those challenges are. So you know, Nicholas raised Year Two and Three, SEND, disadvantage, North South divide. I think all of those things are absolutely fair and absolutely right. I think um, what we're seeing through our members is that some. Um, some schools and some mats are, are, are doing a really, really good job with catch up. But as Nicola is saying, there are others in a position in, in a much, much worse position. And I think that's what um, that's what as a sort of an industry um, publishing wants to see is targeted support to those areas of, of real need. And that's not just about uh, money for my members resources. It's about professional development for teachers. It's about a, ge a general fund funding settlement. I think, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the white paper, um, the school's white paper that was published in March, there were some education investment areas outlined there, the 55 areas that really, really needed support. I think, you know, our position is how can we best spark a creative conversation about how to solve catch up issues in those 55 areas, bringing together school leaders, um, you know, people from the commercial industry, and I think that's what we're trying to do with you, of course, David, here is trying to have these types of conversations in these types of fora, and then hopefully the resultant report can um, can articulate some of those solutions and we can hopefully work with the department to, to implement some of them. Dan, thank you very much. I'm just going to come to Vivek for a question to him about some of his comments, and then I'm going to um, raise two questions that have also come in uh, on our sort of Q&A chat. Uh, Vivek, you mentioned... Um, cheeringly that there might be some positives coming out of the last couple of years, you know, parental engagement, digital and so forth. And you mentioned, well, you know, attention to well-being related issues. Um, in terms of getting consistently good quality of, of well-being support to children across the school system, how do you do that? I mean, are you worried that we could end up with a very different uh, type of provision across the school system um, but then if, if one introduces a sort of accountability element for well-being policies do you end up with all of the sorts of risks that you end that you have with any type of accountability system where you get lots of gaming activities and bad incentives I mean can we really see improvement here that um, helps all children without um, top-down interventions that might be that might create difficult side effects. So I, uh, so firstly, I'd completely agree with you on the accountability side. I think that's that, that's probably the wrong way to address it. Um, I haven't seen a school that isn't acutely aware of the, the need to focus on well-being. So I, I don't think that it's I don't think it's something that needs to be pushed. It's something that needs to be supported, and we need to try and find solutions. There are a number of number of people who are doing more systematic well-being programs. I mean, we don't do we don't have one in the UK, but for example, internationally, we've got something called the Oxford International Curriculum, where we've actually tried to put well-being at the heart of everything. So it's in as you teach when you're teaching maths, there is a well-being component built into the, the there's a, there are patterns and uh, sort of protocols that you follow and uh, which are, which allow you to make sure to ensure that you actually do that. So there's there's plenty of ways of actually structuring it, and I know there are a lot of providers in the UK who can do that. Uh, but I think it's just it's again looking at um, I, I I'm I'm not sure what the obstacles to it are really. I think it's it's for schools to grapple with what a what a whole school solution to well-being could look like, and try to see what the best way to structure that is. Uh, but okay. I think I think it's quite easy to I mean it's not quite easy, but it's possible for schools to do that in a more bottom-up way rather than top-down. That's really interesting. And it, it would be useful actually to get some more information about that international approach sure. that you referred to. I quite like to cross-reference that when we look at the paper we're going to write about this. Um, sure. We've got two other questions that, that have come in that I'd just like to put to people. Um, Graham, I reckon one of these is designed for you. 
uh, because uh, it's about sort of government policy. So it's and it picks up on a couple of the points made earlier. Evidence and impact are increasingly recognised as being of huge importance in selecting the right resource to meet schools' needs. So how does a newly created content by uh, ALB offer this? And is it right to replace, replace, is it right to risk replacing tried and tested paid for resources with free rapidly created content? So I suppose the question here is, you know, is something that was right for the COVID emergency, um, the right evidence led approach beyond that, particularly for disadvantaged peoples and how are we going to make sure that interventions in this area will be um, evidence led? So I'd, so I'd start, um, I will come to um, Oak and the arms length body in a moment, but I'd start with the Education Endowment Foundation. So another 10 years uh, endowment for that, that body. That is um, the body that will start the process of um, evidencing and working through uh, what um, the right sort of interventions are in uh, in different circumstances. And I think the it follows that the arm's length body, in thinking about curricular materials, um, needs to you know follow significantly where the EEF is and needs to to work really clearly within schools and with um, what the best schools have done. And I think the the triumph of um, Oak Academy during the pandemic, which I think does carry forward to the uh, new set of circumstances is um, it's sort of by teachers for teachers approach. Uh, and I think that does apply in the same way in, um, in the new environment as in the old. Um, and I mean, I think you know there is a, there is a sense in which the sort of speed with which some of those lessons were were stood up during the pandemic won't necessarily be replicated in quite the same way in the new body. I mean, obviously, we want things um, to be done quickly. Um, um, you always do, um, but they do need to be evidence. They need to be worked through, and it will then be for teachers um, to decide whether to use those materials or. The longer standing uh, materials. Now, you know, I accept, of course, there's a, a differential there, isn't there? Because the oak materials will be free to use us in a way that um, the commercial materials aren't. Um, but you know, there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that too, and a reason for giving schools access to a well evidenced and you know developed over time and and reviewed and re evidenced um, over time set of materials which are free to them at the point of delivery. So um, it's not the same as, as Oak during the pandemic was, uh, and it'll need to develop. Um, and, you know, I would see it sitting alongside um, the work that colleagues uh, in publishing have, have done. Graham, thank you very much. Um, we've only got a few more minutes before um, Dame Rachel's session. Um, so because we're losing Nicola from this, um, uh, after this panel, I'm going to put the last two questions to her. Um, and then we'll go over to Dame Rachel. So one of them, Nicola, which has come in, um, I think probably is one that you will have uh, direct experience of. ECHP and safeguarding issues are increasing at a frightening rate. Local authorities appear to be swamped and are slow to respond. And the most vulnerable are struggling for many reasons. Uh, any comments on that? And then I'm afraid, I seem to be throwing you a, a lot of horrible questions today, so I do apologize for that. But I suppose the final question I wanted to put before we lose you is, um, what is at the moment the biggest obstacle for you in trying to make up some of that lost learning, particularly for disadvantaged students that we've seen um, over the uh, pandemic. I mean, is it a finance issue? Is it finding the staff? Is it um, is it attendance? Uh, is it students have become disconnected from education? I know it's probably lots of things, but um, it would be negligent of me not to ask you that question. So, LAs and vulnerability, and then that final thing, and then and then I'm going to hand over to Rachel. Thank you. Um, and so in answer to your first um, question around EHCPs and safeguarding, um, 
ditto I would say we are seeing exactly the same I think I've made enough comments today on the challenges around um, SEND we too are seeing increasing numbers of children coming in with increasing needs their needs haven't been met early haven't been identified early we are now identifying them in school particularly with our youngest children um, because they've not been attending speech and language and you know whatever it might be um, uh, so waiting lists for agencies are really really long so we have become more of a not not just a school we are a community hub we do speech and language we you know we have engaged with health we have engaged with a whole host of agencies and um, as sort of a, a center as a center point so I don't have any answers to that I and, and and it's it's a situation that does really really worry me and um, you know we have two schools that have integrated resource with children's with the HCPs we could fill them both three times over with the number of requests that we are getting from the local authority about children with um, with the, with needs that are coming through. Um, uh, similarly, with safeguarding, and again, I think a lot of that comes back down to um, a the state that families are in, the financial difficulties that they're facing, but also anxiety, loss of jobs. So therefore, you know, there's you know a, a whole host of home circumstances that are leading to to challenges around safeguarding social care etc in terms of biggest optical uh, obstacles i think you named some of them and um, so we have challenges around staff we um you know some of our roles in staff we are unable now to compete with the labor market in terms of costs so um other businesses are offering jobs with what people might perceive to be better hours better rates of pay and it suits them better so you know some of our jobs that we need we're struggling to recruit to um attendance and, and persistent absence i've already mentioned um, but I would also say a challenge for us is we are still suffering ongoing COVID absences. And it was well reported, I think, last week that one in 10 secondary school teachers was absent last week. We had schools in our trust last week really on their needs because of staff with COVID and children with COVID. So COVID hasn't gone away. We are still recovering. And I think it's really important that, that people recognise that, you know, we are not back to where we were pre-2019. You know, schools are working incredibly hard. From my trust, you know, we've had two Ofsteds in, the re in recent weeks, and I'm really proud of how our recovery education was seen by Ofsted and really recognise that the improvements, you know, that have been made. However, those improvements are going to take time and they're going to embed, they're, 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 those, those improvements are going to need time to embed and be sustained. So I, I, I think there, there are uh, obstacles and I think there will continue to be obstacles, but, you know, working alongside colleagues, knowing the colleagues that I, you know, I engage with, we are really, really working hard as schools, as professionals to do what we can with the, with the resources available. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a finance issue, if I'm honest. Now, some colleagues might disagree with us, but we are not seeing that finance is a massive, massive issue. Um, it's filling posts, getting people to do the jobs and the right people to do the right jobs, I think is a big challenge for us. Nicola, that was great. And thank you for reminding us that even though as a society, we're sort of sort of getting back to normal after COVID uh, in many respects, there's still a great deal of disruption in many areas, including in the school system. Um, that was very helpful. Um, that's the end of that first panel. Um, I, we may well lose Nicola and Graham to other commitments, but thank you both uh, in particular, as well as Vivek and Dan, who are going to stay on for the second panel. We really appreciate you giving up uh, the time uh, to take part in that first debate. Thank you both very much indeed. But I'm now absolutely delighted uh, that we have got uh, Dame Rachel uh, with us uh, today, the Children's Commissioner for England, who's been in post now for... Is it over a year, Rachel? Uh, and no, making quite an impact months. for 15, 15 months. months. Yeah. And has made already quite an impact on a number of uh, different uh, areas. Uh, Rachel, thank you so much for giving up time to be here today. Um, and we're delighted now to hear from you and hopefully uh, put a couple of uh, quick questions to you at the end. Thank okay. you. Over to you, Rachel. 
Thanks so much, David, and good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for inviting me to your event and to talk on this really important topic that I'm absolutely evangelical about, um, education recovery accessible to all. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, for, from 30 years of experience as a teacher and a head teacher and running a trust of schools, um, I understand the importance of good systems, good schools, good teachers in helping children dream big and achieve their ambitions. Education transforms the way children can, uh, see themselves in the world and can help turn aspirations into tangible opportunities and outcomes. Last year, I launched the Big Ask, the largest children's survey of its kind. We got 557 thousand and seventy seven responses so largest ever survey response in england second in the world only to the us census all 151 local authority areas um, had at least three percent of their children respond um, and you know we made sure we were in yois in children's mental health facilities as well as in schools you know we, we used all our children's networks and ninety four thousand children with special educational needs responded. So we've got some fantastic, when we cut the data, uh, ways of looking at the responses. We had a, so, so a great privilege and we heard from them about, you know, just as they were coming out, out of lockdown, I asked them, what did they, what did they feel was preventing them from thriving and what did they want for their futures? And they talked to us about, their mental health, their mental well-being coming out of lockdown. They talked about life at school, their desire to catch up. They talked about places to go, things to do, and their big dreams for the future about, you know, having a great job, um, having a career. I met the next two prime ministers. I met a range of young people with great aspirations. We might need them. Um, but also, you know, they talked about friends, family life, things to do as adults, and great civic pride and community pride. But they did tell me absolutely that they liked school. They actually told me that they loved their teachers. They were just coming out of lockdown, but it's actually good to hear it. Um, and they came to a new realization during lockdown of the importance of school. They couldn't wait to get back to see their teachers, to be with their friends, to go back to their clubs, go on trips, do the things. I, uh, you know, children have talked to me about their school dinners, that favorite teacher, those activities that they only get to do at school with their peers. But it's vital, a good education, you know, supporting catch up and equal opportunities are available to every single child, no matter where they are in the country as well, I would say as these wider, um, you know, well-being giving things around around you know wider activities too so we're dealing with a generation i am absolutely convinced now of eager thoughtful passionate children and young people who care about their communities they care about getting a good education they described an ambitious socially conscious reforming vision of the world they want to live in rather than being divided on these issues across all identity groups children were united they want the same things they value a society where all can succeed that it's fair they want to create contribute to a world where they're not held back and they're incredibly caring about each other sadly this is too often not the case in their experience we're still living in a postcode lottery when it comes to opportunities and support and sometimes education too. It's, it's quality in those areas is still often too often largely determined by where you were born and where you've grown up. Post pandemic, it's vital we start to level out the experiences children have of the services that support them and raise them all to the, to the level of the best. And as adults, policymakers, teachers, and school leaders, we must role model the inclusive and ambitious behavior that we see in children. We need to match their ambitions with our own. And we need to create a future where all of our children can succeed in a world that they want to live in. And providing every child with access to a quality education is key to addressing the inequalities we see in this society. I not only know this, I believe it after 30 years as an educator in the, in the very root of my existence. There are, there are some very positive reforms in this area and I've been involved in trying to help shape many of them as, as I'm sure many of you. We've got the school's white paper, the Send Green paper, which frankly, when I saw the Send Green paper last July, I, I basically went to spoke to the Secretary of State and, and said, I, I'm afraid um, I can't support it. It's got to go back. 
Um, and to his credit, it went back and we had quite a delayed send green paper, but it's a much better paper um, with, with things in it than it was last June. And I'm hopeful for it. The care review, they've all got the promise to change the way that all children experience their childhoods and learn to achieve their dreams. But they must be delivered as part of one coherent reform agenda. And that's my thesis for today. I'm trying to work with government to ensure that happens so we can deliver for every child. For me, that the, the, we've had this massive reform movement in education. You know, I became a head in two, uh, uh, Tony Blair's number 67th Academy principal. I was, I was saying that yesterday. Um, and here I am, what, 15, 16 years later. Um, education's unrecognizably better, but there are so many bits we still need to do, particularly in the support around the child, send, mental health, um, the extended day. And those things are an important part of the package, package of education recovery. Um, the reality still is that the children who most need to be at a good school are least likely to be going to one. And that's why we need to redouble our efforts to make sure every school in England is brilliant in the education it provides, not just Ofsted good, and in the belief it instills in its pupils and the wider support it, it offers. So over the coming weeks, I mean, I'm very concerned about SEND, SEND support, mental health support at home, um, and particularly for young carers, you know, or children who, children and families that need to navigate children's social care. We must do better to support our most vulnerable. And over the coming weeks, I'm going to be out talking with children in SEND to try, try and bring children's voice in SEND and alternative provision into this, this swathe of these layers of policy reform that are no doubt a little bit on hold at the moment, so that as soon as the machine starts again, we've got children's voice right at the heart of them. We've made excellent progress in education reform in recent years, but the job isn't done. You know, we're still worrying about, about, about uh, narrowing the gap and, and the pandemic has put a great big chasm in the gap. So if the school system doesn't work for all our young people, we're not doing well enough. And I truly believe if we make schools work for all children, we can address the inequality we see in our society, which has only been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, but we can't do that if we don't know where children are. Look, I am tearing out my hair up here. I've been working all year on attendance. We've seen um, persistent attendance, 50% higher in the first term of, in our first term, only 20% of that 50% is because of COVID. I've gone out and, uh, and the same for, for, um, for severe attendance. We've still got children who aren't on any role. Um, half of children in AP are not back at school. One in four children with a social worker are not back at school. And post pandemic, one in four children were persistently absent from school compared to one in nine in 2018-19. Uh, um, so I've published my findings, I've worked uh, on attendance, I won't go on about them, but what I would say, I've published a set, my latest attendance update today, um, we did some work with Maps just to look into basically deep dive their attendance data. And what did we find? If children aren't back on the first day of term, and if they're not back for the first four days of a new term, they're 40% more likely not to be back at all. I mean, we have to take every child, and I'm sure every educator on here will agree with me, makes that decision am I going back this September? Whatever they've been doing, you in their heart, in their heads, they think, is this my chance for a new start? And I think given the impasse in politics that, um, that's gonna be here over the summer, the one thing we could gamefully look at is getting all children back that we can to, attend to, to school in September. And that means dealing with their mental health, their SEND, whatever the barriers, SEND assessments, whatever the barriers are that are holding them back. We need to, we really need to be supporting them. And to finish, I just want to end with the last chat, last, um, last quote and the last uh, paragraph from my big ass survey, because it just brings it home to me. Um, when we ask children, what was holding them back in England in 2021? A 16 year old boy told us something sad. The social stigma of children from lower class backgrounds trying to achieve something bigger than themselves. I'll just read that again. It's 2022. Children from lower class backgrounds trying to achieve something bigger than themselves. We should tell him, of course, there's nothing bigger than the lives of children. So not to scorn ambition, we could try to build something equal to it. Thank you.
Rachel, thank you very much indeed for that address. Um, fascinating, and you, you covered some really interesting territory there in a short period of time. Um, can I just um, uh, put to you a couple of questions that have come in uh, before we lose you? Have you got five minutes? Yeah, uh, for you, David, always. Thank you, Rachel. You, you were obviously typically um, positive in your, in your comments on the whole about um, the capacity of the system to deal with uh, education recovery and address lots of problems that have arisen over the last couple of years. But in our earlier panel discussion, we heard obviously a lot about the dispersion of experience over the last two years. Some students, you know, haven't fallen behind at all. Others have fallen behind a long way if they're disadvantaged or if they're the wrong school or the wrong area. Um, how confident are you that we are going to see on the basis of existing policies, a pretty comprehensive education recovery over the next couple of years? Or are there a couple of things that you're really pressing for um, that you think are going to be necessary for the education recovery to be something that all children share in? Yeah, so I think, I think um, first of all, don't, don't take my glass half full and sort of, uh, passion for banking the good stuff that's been achieved as uh, an unrealistic look at where we are. I actually think many of our children are seriously vulnerable. I think many of our schools are struggling. And I think, you know, I just caught on to the last bit of conversation about, and now we're feeling that next wave of, of um, you know, COVID creeping up, it's still there. We've got we've got issues there. But one thing I truly believe in is the, um, you know, resilience, commitment and, you know, stunning. I mean, I, I saw stunning uh, things during the pandemic. We may be feeling a bit, a, a lot of fatigue now because it's it's been going on for so long. But, you know, I, I was in school every day during the pandemic until the March when I took up this job and I watched you know, my teachers, my TAs doing, you know, doing things like, you know, delivering beds, delivering food, you know, checking on vulnerable children. And it just made me realize that this vision for schools at the heart of their community, you know, is is now proven. I think, I think, you know, head head to the estimation that people hold their head teachers in and school and what children hold their schools in is massive. Now that seems to me as a great springboard to actually move forward with a great education recovery package. You know, I want more, David, you know, I would love to see, and I was passionate about an extended school model. Um, I think some of the things I talked to you about there around children wanting what children love about school and that, 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 supports their mental health and well-being you know the, the issues that they're raising are being able to play together be together do the activities that they need together they look to support for their mental well-being to school we're not asking less of school we're asking more so I think there's something about I, I've talked a fair bit there about the long-term vision you know, which is let's get all these schools the send green paper, I think it's good. There's nugget, you know, there's lots in the school's white paper, like the family of schools model, whatever shape that is, is the place to deliver this this vision. Um, you know, I'm particularly concerned about children in care. I believe schools are very much an, a, a, an answer. And, you know, I want social workers working far more closely with schools to plan children and care's placements with education, with their education as well. There's so much there, like for the for the future for the next five years now I think we need true deep understanding of the situation many schools and especially isolated schools are in I would be really doing practical on the ground things if we need to support attendance how can we support it what can we do to to you know really get uh, support for schools with extra attendance officers learn from the best put schools together you know, uh, uh, I would, as Secretary of State, be coming with a thousand practical things to help this summer. Never mind Rishi's um, eat out to whatever out. I would be, I would be having a whole program in education and social care. They have programs good, but I'd go even further. I think there's a lot we should be doing now, and I think um, we need the current educate the current sort of political. Uh, mess to settle so that everyone, the government can focus on that. 
we are a self-improving system. Strong trusts are doing lots of this, but you know, the job has got to be to partner schools up, to make sure LAs are able to function. So that there are, a, I mean, we could talk for an hour about the practical things that could happen now. Long-term, I can really see the way. Great. I and before letting you go, I'm going to ask you one other question that's coming for you, um, which you'll be well placed to answer, not just because of your existing role, but because you've run schools yourself. Yeah. So we had a question earlier about the sustainability and the long term prospects of the National Tutoring Programme. And we got a question for you, what you think of it and saying, has the lack of consistency with it impacted on how much schools want to use it? And are you worried that tutoring might not actually become embedded in schooling, particularly if the dedicated funding streams uh, taper off? Yeah, so I, I actually think um, tutoring is probably one of the things w many schools will continue and, and actually embed out of the whole package of, of uh, things. Now, I don't mean that that that, that uh, I think it's been a, a superb success everywhere, and I understand what everyone else has gone through, but schools like mine, we would have, we were already dipping our toe into, you know, um, uh, university graduates, tutoring our, tutoring our A-level students, postgraduates, and so, you know, in maths, this kind of thing. I think we now, where it's worked well, it's, I think it's worked very well. I'd like to see, um, I, I, I mean, I think one of the mistakes was not allowing, not thinking through both allowing schools to make their own arrangements, um, but also thinking of the coal spots and thinking really creatively about, you know, how we could actually get tutoring to, to those cold spots where there wasn't the supply of tutors. Um, I do, I, I think, I think it probably will carry on. I think many heads will embed it. I think many of us were doing it anyway. Um, I think we've missed some opportunities because we could have we could have done it more. But I think it's the I, I think the awareness of the evidence base of the power of tutoring, I think, really has um, perhaps become more ubiquitous as opposed to a bit of a minority sport or a bit of a bit of a trade secret. Great, Rachel, thank you very much indeed. On that positive note, um, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I think you now have to go on to another, another event, but thank you for joining us. And we're now going to go into our, our second panel. Rachel, thank you very much indeed. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, right, we're now going to go into our, our second and final panel. Uh, so we've got about 45 minutes to cover uh, the, the big issue, but one that we also uh, touched on in an earlier roundtable about how ed tech can be optimized to support education recovery and inclusion. And as well as Dan and Vivek, we're now joined by two new panelists uh, who we're delighted to have here today and who also participated in the earlier roundtables that we had on this issue. Uh, so welcome to uh, Rory and to Fiona. And I'm gonna start on this issue uh, with uh, Rory, who is the head teacher of Shacklewell Primary School. Uh, Rory, you're very welcome today and uh, over to you for your thoughts on the issues that, uh, that we've raised. Well, thank you, David. Thank you for allowing me to start. Um, welcome, uh, hello everyone. Um, I've been really enjoying that, that discussion from uh, the Children's Commissioner. So it was a great, great launch pad for this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm here and I'm, I'm really passionate about the power of ed tech to transform people's lives. I think that the children in uh, my school and in the group of schools I'm lucky to work within, um, we have seen huge impacts on the children's lives and their confidence to be successful learners. Um, to give you a little bit of context for, about what I'm talking about is that I've got, uh, I'm the head teacher here of a two-form primary school in Hackney, and we are a group of four schools who are all Apple distinguished and also um, users of G Suite. So we have a, 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 a mixed uh, estate in terms of devices that we use and, and uh, software systems that we interact with. The, the thing that I, I sort of want to really focus in on the, as you can see from the agenda, is this uh, idea around disadvantaged. And, and I would actually sort of challenge the question around it, increasing disadvantage for pupils. I, I, I really think that ed tech and its uh, capacity and capabilities is allowing children to access learning in far, far different ways than it would have done previously. And it is allowing children who previously would have had barriers in terms of social and cultural experiences to actually uh, bridge those gaps and to be able to break them down and, and share 
much more in common in terms of those cultural um, those cultural experiences and these things. So we, we firmly believe here at, at New Year Federation, that where the group of schools I work for, that the more technology is in the hands of the children, the more they're going to be successful in their education. I, I do think, and it's a really pertinent question, and I, I'm looking forward to having this discussion around the role of evidence within this, because as, as technology is moving so quickly, and the way that it's being used in schools is, is so different on a you know, school by school basis. I, I do think there is a problem or, or, or a difficulty in terms of finding some great research. And I know that lots and lots of organizations, particularly the EEF have done a great deal of work around it already. But I do, I do think that the, the way that we're going to encourage and convince more colleagues and more schools and more groups of schools to get behind technology is to have a really solid base of evidence that, that can't be refuted and, and can't be sort of uh, downplayed. I think that's what's going to help us as a group of people who are interested in this particular area to really ensure that that message is spread, um, spread across the, the country. Rory, that's a great introduction to the subject. May I just follow up with two quick questions to you. Um, you? You mentioned that you're very positive about the potential for new technology to actually narrow gaps rather than mm -hmm. widen them. Is that a potential that you're optimistic about or is it uh, what you see happening, um, not just in your school, but beyond it at the moment, because obviously there are still understandably lots of concerns about mm -hmm. digital access, uh, both to devices and you know, ability to access on those devices. So it's perfectly possible to imagine that, that for a period of time, it could actually leave some people behind. Um, do you think there's a lot more that we need to do in order to ensure that this is a, a disadvantage um, a challenger rather than something that will make things uh, potentially worse for a period? Um, I, th I think there's there's probably two aspects to that that I, I think are can be dealt with and should be dealt with separately, which is around the where they're accessing it. So is the access that we're talking about here in terms of improving life chances across the board or is it that it's access to information technology and devices within in the school building itself or particularly at, at home and I think we are only going to have a limited impact if it is only within the school that we're framing this question because as we know you know children who learn to read well are children who are reading home at home as well so actually with the use of technology and, and being able to access lots of different types of information I think we do have to have um, how can these children access these devices at home? And I know lots of us on the call will have experienced it during the pandemic and, and since then that the more devices in the home does not always lead to more quality outcomes or more quality output from the children because actually um, space and, and Wi-Fi capability issues and busy home lives can have a huge impact. So I, I think it's, it's quite a difficult thing to sort of pinpoint, but why I think it's important that we do tackle it as an issue is because that when the children are together in the school building or even you know, being able to use them at home, the things that they can find out, the things they can produce, the opportunities that they're able to share together are, are worth the effort. And I, and I think that it's really um, the part, you know, the things that I see in my school every day where, where the children are really successfully engaging with each other and, and sharing things is, is worth it. Great, and before I move on to Vivek, I'm gonna to come mm. to you next. Um, can, I, uh, can I lob to you a slightly um, nasty question without notice which is you know if you had to recommend one thing in this ed tech area <laughs> that has worked brilliantly for you uh, I'm not necessarily talking about one particular product <laughs> by the way where you're going to um, mm -hmm. uh, be asked to um, criticize or commend a provider but if there's something you've done with ed tech and you thought wow that has been really successful um, and really helped other schools should be doing this. Um, is there a standout thing? Um, yes, I'm going to be naughty in reply and give you two things. Uh, the first is that it has to be held by the leaders of the school. It has to be a vision of all children and all of the devices being used or whatever it is. So it can't just be a really enthusiastic computing lead has suddenly got a hold of some bits of devices. It actually, if you want ed tech to have a massive impact on your school structure, you need to have it as a core part of your delivery methods of the curriculum, because otherwise it's just an add on. So that really um, clear focus on vision for the school using ed tech is, is, is vital. The, the second little bit I will squeeze in there is prioritize staff over pupils in the initial stage of any rollout, because if you give the staff the devices and then just say, get on with it, 
or here you go, your children have got 30 uh, unnamed, unnamed devices, then you're going to come unstuck because the colleagues will not have the confidence to deliver it. So yeah, our process that has been most successful is, you know, we give them an intensive amount of support in using the devices that we have chosen to use and then roll them out to the pupils so the teachers have got the confidence to use them. So. Thanks, Rory. That sounds like very good advice on both points. Uh, Viva, I'm going to come to you uh, second. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, so obviously, digital. I mean, we at OEP we firmly believe that digital is can significantly enhance the experience for both the teacher and the and the learner. So it's both sides of that. Um, it's an area where we are probably investing. The bulk of our investment is actually going into more digital areas. Um, Sorry, I have to just say, unless the DFE does something silly, in which case, obviously, that all goes to see it goes away. But um, but that's but that's our current plan, and that's how we see things. Uh, that's how we see things going forward. Um, I think the uh, you know a couple of the points that you uh, we see we see where where it is at its most useful is where it is saving teacher time. It's actually being able to make their tasks easier and be. Able uh, it's really useful when, because of the amount of data it generates and how you are able to view that data and make it relevant to a teacher to be able to, model, to modify what he or she is doing. Um, and as a, result, as, as a result of that, you get a greater degree of personalization. So you can do more clever things with personalization, but actually I think the, gen, the, the, the core of it is that if you actually generate the right data, which allows teachers and students to monitor progress well, uh, then it it really does uh, help move uh, forward. On the point of uh, evidence, um, it's a tricky one because we've seen we've seen with you know we we have uh, I mean some of our platforms are in almost every school in the country. But when you try and generate evidence, it's you you need to be really careful about how well it is being because the range of implementation of these uh, platforms is immense. So you will get some schools which have a subscription, but almost uh, you almost wonder why because they hardly ever use it, and you've got others who are using it to its fullest. So what what you are measuring and why you're measuring and what you plan to do with it, I think it, it. I mean, evaluation is a tricky is a tricky area. So to me, it sort of boils down to um, making sure that whatever digital product is being evaluated, that you're actually evaluating the underlying pedagogy and making sure that it is actually something that fits with your philosophy and fits with what you're trying to do and is grounded in good research, uh, good educational research. Um, I was going to do a pitch for one of my products, but I'll hold off doing that. But uh, um, but that's the, I think when it comes to evidence, that's, you know, uh, the quality of evidence will depend on the quality of implementation. So I, so to me, it's much more about making sure it's from, it's, it's, it's about the pedagogy more than anything else. Um, I think the other big part which digital has the ability to do is to try and bridge that school home uh, divide. And I, I think Rory, you, you, you mentioned that, but right now, um, so increasingly everything that we develop, we, we develop, we might be developing it for school, but we will look at how it can be used outside of school. And how can you, how can we support parents in, in supporting their children through it? If we're developing something for the home, we look at what you know, what its application in school could be, or is there a, a way we can pull it out? So I think uh, being able to straddle both those worlds is uh, is really important. Um, access obviously is a is is a challenge. Rory mentioned it. I don't know that there are easy solutions to it. If we were talking in a more rational world, we'd be investing in libraries, we'd be investing in things like that, but we're not. So I don't know what the answers are necessarily to the access issues are. Um, and finally, I'd say on professional development, I think that's a key, that's an area where um, uh, some some of the other panelists might disagree. But you, but but I, I think that uh, teachers are still very much learning on the job and learning on on whatever platform has been adopted, whatever tool has been adopted in the school. Um, it occurred to me a little while ago, and where something we're working on that we we when we don't actually have any subscriptions from te from teacher training colleges, um, but we would happily we'd happily sort of give our products for free to train teachers on. But they should be learning. They should be they should when they when they're learning how to teach, they should be having digital tools at their disposal at that point in time to be able to 
learn how to get the best of it and uh, so that when so that this is not a new thing that they that they're learning when they're uh, in school and maybe i'm over i'm over exaggerating the point but uh, i do think that there's a big part to be done in early teacher training um, around digital thank you that, that covered a lot of really interesting issues say a little bit more will you about the point you started off on where you talked about your own desire as an organization to invest more in this area and then you talked i think uh, you talked about what the dfe are doing and oak and everything um Talk about when nationally driven stuff in this area stops being good and might be difficult from your perspective. I mean, Oak was one of the things during the crisis that quite a lot of people said, mm -hmm. oh, this is quite good. This is really helpful for schools. One of the few things that government actually got any praise for. And now they're looking to sort of roll this out further. But what's your particular worry specifically on the ed tech area about what that could lead to? Well, so so um, so again, I, I, firstly, I'd, I'd agree with you completely. I mean, Oak during the during lockdown was a fantastic tool for. I mean, it was something at least it gave everyone access to something. Um, now it looks like we've got a solution in search of a problem, um, and what happens is that if if the arms link body is going to be creating free resources for uh, for schools. Um, I, I, as a publisher, I have to now decide, let's say if I'm looking at real, real world, uh, this thing, we're, we're, we're creating a, something, what we call this, we call, we call this, it's the smart curriculum, which we're launching for key stage three in science this year. Right. And it's got a whole lot of, it's a, it's a massive investment, um, you know, and, and we think it's got some, you know, really strong pedagogical bases, including sort of metacognition or, you know. Uh, there's a whole uh, range of so I won't I won't, but but we are investing millions in that on the assumption that we're creating something that will have a long life and we're starting with science but we're bringing English maths everything. Else. What happens if you what ha, what 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 decision do I take if I know that the DFE is creating a free maths key stage three resource? I stop my investment, or I or I would have or or I'm or I'm. Or I have to go in on the assumption that I'm creating something beautiful and the DFE is going to create something terrible. Uh, but that's a that's a that's it. the point is that it's it's a somewhat it's a somewhat needless debate to have because the DFE has the has the, the money and the platform, which I think if they wanted to, I mean, I'd happily spend whatever time with any of them. There are so many better ways that they could spend their time. Um, but if this is what they are set on, then it means that all of us have to think twice about: Do I want to? Do I want to go there at all? Okay. Uh, so that that's the that's the concern. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to bring in uh, Dr. Fiona Aubrey Smith, uh, the director of One Life Learning, who took part in our previous panel on this, and uh, is a really strong and very interesting voice on this topic. Fiona. Thank you so much, David, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this panel. I've really enjoyed hearing from colleagues this afternoon, and hopefully I can share a few insights from my hands-on work with schools and multi-academy trusts, as well as from my academic research. So first, I think I'd like to draw um, colleagues' attention to four significant pieces of research about EdTech. Um, the first is by led by Professor Peter Twain. It was a large-scale qualitative study that found Pre-pandemic, edtech purposes were almost always for schools or teachers' benefit rather than for the benefit of the child and their learning. The second piece of research I want to bring to the table is, was led by um, Professor Neil Selwyn. It was an international meta-analysis about the uses of edtech in schooling, and that concluded that teachers act as pedagogical gatekeepers, so opening or closing the doors of opportunity for our students. And that kind of echoes the important point Vivek was making just a moment ago about pedagogy leading technology, moving from edtech education-based technology to pedtech pedagogy-led technology. The, the third bit of research I want to draw in is a systematic literature review, which found that the digital divide is no longer just about access to devices and connectivity. It's now about the choices we make about what learning looks like in our classrooms. 
And I just want to draw on, um, funnily enough, a, a report from Oxford University Press called Addressing the Deepening Digital Divide that summarises the key issue we must um, consider around this. It's a brilliant quote. It says, if these forms, new forms of digital divide are left unaddressed, then the gap between the underconnected and the hyper-digitalised will widen, aggravating existing inequalities. So that's a huge issue, isn't it? And, and one that Rachel surfaced beautifully in her keynote about the importance of levelling up to bring every child the very best opportunities. So what's the answer to all this? It's all about the choices that we make. And Nicola talked about this earlier in relation to the generations of children coming through our schools now who have very unique needs as a result of the pandemic, not least of which anxiety about attending school and about being amongst other people and that lack of exposure to stimulating learning experiences. Now, earlier this week, I visited the Inspire Learning Partnership of Schools in Southampton who captured this perfectly uh, when they said, we use EdTech to support improvements to teaching and learning. Simple phrase, but that keyword, it was about improvements. It's not about using ed tech just to support or enhance education. It's about doing it differently in order to do it better. It's about making a positive impact on children's learning experiences and children's learning identities, as Rachel so powerfully illustrated in her keynote earlier on. And in terms of ed tech, a key part of this will be achieved through that kind of nationwide shift we're seeing towards one-to-one -one device access. It's a vital shift. And as Rory was saying earlier, for every child to be able to access a device that spans both home and school, and for expectations around tech use to be whole school expectations, that consistent uniform message to our learners. And those devices enable instant access then to, to significant things, features and functionality that make learning more accessible, more personal, more instant. And we know that has a massive effect a massive impact on progress and attainment. And we're seeing increasing ranges of good quality evidence, both qualitative and quantitative, that supports this. I'll give you two empirical examples. So last week I was working with a group of secondary schools and they've seen two years worth of progress in one year with a particular cohort as a direct result of real-time feedback being given to every single child through things like automated marking, artificial intelligence-based content packages, real-time assessment for learning. But it was only achieved because every child had their own device. And that's what makes real-time personalization possible. And some of those automated features also have that added benefit of freeing up teacher time so they can then focus on being the professionals that they are, are, are there to be, that we know that they can be by providing targeted interventions for the children who really need them. And another quick example, I was working earlier this week with a group of schools where progress rates have been phenomenal due to audio and video teacher feedback, access in school on one-to-one -one devices. Children consequently were owning their learning, reflecting on it, internalising it and applying it with vital lifelong learning skills. And that makes the process of learning a way of life. Then it makes a massive impact on progress for all children, but particularly for children with SEND, for those with anxiety, for our persistent absentees, the very children that Nicola and Graham and Rachel were all speaking about earlier as having suffered the most as a result of the pandemic. And that's just not, not just anecdotal. So Twining and Maher in an international study found that children who were using one-to-one uh, -one devices or bring your own device became more discerning about their learning because technology is no longer the novelty, the, the, the ad hoc, that, oh, it's out, you know. It emphasizes the emphasis of those learners shifts towards practice that develop greater metacognition. And we know, as colleagues have mentioned already, the um, research around metacognition shows it's one of the biggest levers to make learning better for every single child. And importantly, that makes a massive difference for children who are being held back by different forms of disadvantage. So one-to-one -one device access is about, is about opening doors for every child. It's about putting the power of learning in their hands. It's about building on the evidence, leveraging the huge impact of metacognitive strategies. It's about focusing on how we can use those ideas um, to support progress, attainment, and lifelong trajectories for all students. And you'll notice here that the focus is on every single child. And it's important that we close that gap that's been created, the disadvantage gap that Nicola and Graham talked earlier on so insightfully about. And we can do that through the choices we make. As professionals, we either open doors for children or we close them. And with EdTech, too often at the moment, the doors are left closed. 
sometimes usually due to a lack of awareness, a lack of skills or a lack of confidence. And I want to just draw on a quick example from um, one of the most phenomenal head teachers I've ever met, Marva Rollins OBE, who spoke about her children at uh, Raynham Primary School in Enfield, many of whom have incredibly challenging circumstances which could prevent their accessing and engaging education. So big issues like knife crime, poverty, refugee trauma. But as she says, these children still have to grow up and live in the same world as all the other children who do have the opportunities, who do have the privileges, who do have access to technologies. So we need to work harder than ever to utilize what we can give them access to. We can give the children access, skills, confidence, and tech can do that if it's put into the hands of learners. Some couple of very quick examples of that, and I'm thinking of schools with high levels of disadvantage to empowered children with one-to-one -one devices, often using a mixed economy, and, and I think um, Rory spoke briefly about this earlier, bringing in, bring your own devices, donated devices, school-bought devices, and working with charitable device partners such as Second Chance, it is achievable to create a one-to-one -one ecosystem for those schools who want to do it. There are lots of creative ways to overcome these common concerns around cost, security, and connectivity. And there's lots of schools who are willing and keen to provide guidance to others about how to move beyond those issues. So we, we don't need to um, be held back by those. Let's take it as read that over the coming months and years, we'll move closer to that ubiquitous one-to-one -one landscape. And that empowers us and frees us up to think about how devices will be used to access published lesson resources, personalised reading comprehension tasks, regular maths retrieval practice, engaging science practical demonstrations, individualized assessment where artificial intelligence is responding to those needs and addressing misconceptions, the list goes on. But the key to it is also about the use of accessibility features. So translation for our students for whom English is not their first language, the ability to rewind and replay the teacher, to balance cognitive load, to sequence activities for children with ASD, for example. And with this environment, with a one-to-one -one landscape, no child is made to feel different because they need personalized help because every child is having personalized help. Every child deserves learning and interventions that respond to their gaps, their needs, their aspirations, and their journey. So EdTech can play a really powerful role in reducing the disadvantage gap. But the message I really want to, to give to finish up today is that actually, if we don't use EdTech with more ubiquity, we are actually inadvertently, perhaps not even consciously, choosing to increase the gap between those who can and are learning and achieving this way, and those who are arguably being prevented from doing so as a direct result of those more limited opportunities. Diana, that was really interesting, and, th and thank you for the evidence uh, sources that you mentioned at the beginning that we'll try to make sure that we also include in the um, document that we publish at the end of this. Um, before I pass on to uh, Dan, our, 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 um, the, the final panellists in this session, can I just ask you to say a bit more about how you guard against the risk that some schools, maybe Rory's, go off and do all of this absolutely brilliantly, use technology, use it for improvements in learning, and others, you know, perhaps with people like me who are a bit more backward on sort of using new technology and everything actually just get stuck in the past. And that means, as you've hinted, that, that you know, we may have greater divergence of experience and outcome. How do you bring the whole system up at once without perhaps going as far as you know, Vivek and Dan have worried about, which is you end up with a sort of national uh, mandated top-down solution that has to be imposed on every single school, which will probably go wrong in one way or, or another. Um, well, it's a really, really important point, and I'm, and I'm glad you've raised it, David. And, and I think what we have to bear in mind is what the research evidence shows us, that ed EdTech magnifies, amplifies existing pedagogical beliefs and existing pedagogical ideas around what makes great teaching and learning. And so in, our, in answer to that kind of gap between schools who are, are doing these amazing things with EdTech and schools who are, are not, and in some time, in some cases are reluctant to, I think the same issues that affect that are also applying to the variants we see in schools more broadly. And if we could, if we could solve the, that kind of golden challenge, if you like, that's a very strange way of framing it, isn't it? Um, about making every school phenomenal, that same approach would apply to using EdTech 
um, in that in that um, more ubiquitous and, e and equal space. So it's actually not about the ed tech at all. It's about pedagogy. It's about teaching and learning. It's about great school leadership. It's about thinking about children at the center, framing school around the child, as Rachel alluded to earlier, rather than framing school around teaching processes systems. It's about realigning our compass and making sure it's absolutely and unapologetically about children and their actions and their future. Great. Fiona, thank you so much for that. Um, and last but not least, Dan. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, David and Fiona. I thought that was I thought that was great, by the way. Um, I think I think um, much of what I want to say has been picked up by other panelists, actually, David. So I just want to reinforce some of the things that have been said, if that's OK. Firstly, um, Pedagogy, really, really important, making sure that the ed tech that you're using is properly sequenced and properly evidenced. Um, I would also um, echo um, the point that was made about early adoption by staff. I think we probably all know from our own experience of our own organisations that kind of bringing in new technologies um, uh, uh, can be very, very difficult. And um, if we can get um, to Vivek's point, if we can get it embedded into teacher training so that people can use it and use it to its best advantage, then that can only be a good thing. Um, the one thing I wanted to raise that, I that no one's raised yet um, is just the importance of hybrid learning as well. I know this panel is about ed, ed tech and, and, and that's rightly the focus, but I think, you know, the sort of digital and physical can't be seen in silos. They need to be able to speak to each other um, and those resources need to be able to match because actually what you're aiming for is a seamless transition, ideally from a physical learning environment to digital within the classroom, to digital or physical at home. And that really is the sort of the end game here is those, those complete curriculum resources that can speak um, uh, both digitally and physically and work in any environment. And that's the sort of, that's the sort of end to end learning offer which which we think is the is the gold standard and is where we should aim to get to so i just wanted to throw that in as well which is that edtech's brilliant we should all support it we should all invest in it but we should also make sure that whatever we're doing in that area is also speaking to the wider learning resources piece so that it's sequenced throughout the piece thank you Dan. thank you that was great um we've had a question coming in a question come in which uh is i think a really interesting one which i might ask a couple of you to comment on um, in thinking about the power of ed tech, do we need to differentiate between education phases and subjects? AI marking can work superbly for primary maths, but critiquing English literature A-level essays is far beyond the tools we currently have access to. In my experience, the value added for sixth form students is still far more in the realm of making teachers' lives easier than in the realm of genuinely improving pedagogy and accelerating learning. I, I think that's something that quite a few of you might have thoughts about. Uh, Vivek, I might start with you. I mean, uh, is this something that works much better for by certain phases and subjects or is that yes. not realistic? It's, it's, it's much easier to, to create an impactful product for uh, in maths and science. And it's much easier, even if you're talking you can, it's much easier to create a digital reading product for younger learners as you're getting up to, you know, key stage four and five. Uh, it, particularly with subjects like English, it, it is much harder to actually, uh, uh, I mean, even though essay marking technology is growing by leaps and bounds, but I think a lot of people would still have concerns about how good it is at judging creativity of writing and things like that. So, so we need to figure where the limitations are. It's just that I, I mean, you know, the the value add for sixth form students may not necessarily be in the or in auto marking. It might be more in terms of sort of an app for revision. It might be so. There's lots of other areas where 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 technology can make the can make the students' lives much easier. It just may not be in the same way as you might do for primary maths. Yeah, that's very interesting. I'm going to ask uh, you, Rory and Fiona, the same question, if you don't mind, because uh, you might you all have slightly different angles on this, Rory. I mean, yes, I think it is phase specific, but I think that um, technology can have an impact on all aspects. And I'm not a key stage uh, three or four specialist, but I think it is interesting that actually some of the biggest and quickest gains we have with technology is in early reading and early speaking, listening down in our reception and the early years. So perhaps it's more 
that the different subjects can be impacted in different ways at different stages of their curricular and uh, development because you know with nursery and reception children using a device to, to record themselves blabber on about the story and talk about the, the ideas they're having about it is not something you could capture or something that you could give them the opportunity to do as effectively without the use of some you know portable devices so I think Yes, there is. Uh, it's like everything. It's not it, one size definitely won't fit all. But I think that there is a measure of success that can come from using our tech to push pupil outcomes in all aspects of their learning journey through school. Thank you. Uh, Fiona, um, same question. Mm. Well, there's two sort of um, pools of research that come to mind um, with this. The first is that we know that um, teachers who teach different subjects and different age ranges have different pedagogical beliefs and different thoughts and ideas around approaches to teaching and learning. So some of this will be in what those teachers bring to the classroom and therefore which technologies they choose to use um, with, within that. Um, and the second aspect is whenever we look at any kind of technology, it's really important to recognise that there will be an embedded pedagogy within the technology itself. And that might differ from feature to functionality to content to whatever it might be, but there is an embedded pedagogy in there. And by unpacking exactly what that is and looking at how that aligns with what we're actually trying to do in the classroom, that's where we can then see if, if the two are aligned, it will make an impact in our classroom. If the two are um, out of sync in terms of the pedagogy that they're trying to um, deliver, then, that, then that's a bit more of a gap. So I think the kind of short version is, we need to just step back from that slightly and think actually as an individual teacher what's the subject knowledge we're trying to work on what's the pedagogical knowledge we're trying to work on and what's the subject specific pedagogical knowledge when we're clear on that the technology just becomes a solution um, to do that so it's about the teacher and the pedagogical beliefs rather than the technology itself thank you very much we're almost out of time so i'm gonna come to one final question which i'll just ask all of you to briefly comment on from your own angles. Uh, Rory started off by talking about a couple of issues. One was around disadvantage and one was around evidence and the concern that in the ed tech space, there should be adequate evidence to drive schools to do the right things. Um, and I suppose the question is, is there at the moment an adequate system which is allowing us or driving us to evidence which edtech interventions are making a good impact or not and are schools understanding what works and able to easily make themselves the right decisions and i suppose you know i'd add to that is the eef sort of the answer to all of this or is there something missing that would help schools to do their job more effectively rory since you um uh, through this out there at the beginning i'm going to come to you then vivek then fiona then then final word of the day to dan um, I, I don't know that i can fit this into a particularly concise answer I'll, I'll try my best to cover a couple of the key things um i don't think that the, there's a enough national strategic um leadership on this from from central government i think that there needs to be a reason for things and i know um i've, I've talked on, about previously around the the sort of the winding down of the edtech demonstrator program which was a really great way of, of, of pushing forward that agenda um <sighs> I think that th there has to be a way of schools understanding that this is the shift that we're going to go through in the next 20, to, well, 10 to 15, 20 years in our education system. Because without that, I think, David, you said it earlier on, there will be situations where schools are, you know, flexible classrooms, children are working at home, they're working at school, you know, work's being pushed out in all sorts of different ways, materials and resources being accessed in lots of different ways, but then you'll still go down the road or you'll go to a different county and there'll still be schools with, you know, almost like a chalkboard and books out on the desk. So it's it's really, I think that that can be managed on a piecemeal, uh, a piecemeal way. And, you know, another project that I'm involved with, which is the English Hub system, is having a huge impact on improving reading outcomes because the government have been able to put money into that and say, this is going to, this isn't a priority for us and it's going to change children's lives. So I think until we have that overarching need for it to be something that schools are moving in the direction of, it's going to be very hard for, for ch schools that have got so many pressures and so many things pushing up against them for them to actually then prioritise this as a direction to travel in. Thank you, Rory. Vivek? Sorry. So for us, I think we we, uh, um, we we deal with a variety of schools and different schools have different approaches to this. And so we do tend to develop differing solutions for 
different types of schools. So, um, so we might have a product which we think is the gold standard, but we might have something which is a little lighter touch to, for, for schools, which maybe don't want to make that kind of a commitment right up front. Um, but in terms of in terms of how you the, the, the question was about how how do you help schools sort of evaluate and make the right decisions and 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 I don't know what the right answer to this is. I mean, I, I would say that uh, you for any school, the implementation of a of technology is very often a partnership between the the ed tech or the publisher and the school. So it's not something that you just sell a subscription and walk away. Um, for us, our lifeblood is the fact that we, we know we only get, I mean, the commercial argument is that you only get success if people use it because then uh, they keep renewing. So we, so people like us would make a massive investment in training, uh, holding the hand of teachers as they, if they're running through it, running ongoing workshops uh, about, you know, details that, you know, to begin with, maybe they only use a certain feature set, but there's a lot more that it can do. So help guiding them through that. So to me, I think the, uh, again, the, uh, I, I think just at the time of evaluation, you just want to make sure that you're choosing a, you're choosing a product, but you're also choosing a partner. And I think just recognizing that I think is really important. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Fiona. Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? The first, there's there's a trend for quantitative studies at the moment and meta-analyses and rankings and randomised control trials and, and all stuff that makes quite easy reading and, and certainly very quick headlines. And the challenge is that tells us what might be more likely to happen from a kind of probability perspective. But if we unpack that for a moment, so RCTs comparing children attend school with those who don't will probably show that children are more likely to learn if they're at school, but it doesn't mean that children will learn at school. That's all dependent on other contextual factors. So we need to redress that kind of balance in edtech research with, with qualitative, with contextually based research, and more focus on the human beings that are at the middle of all of this, more focus on the influences that identify the variance between what people believe, what people think, what people say, what people do, and most importantly, what children actually experience and how that affects their internalized views of learning. So, and that makes it about the pedagogy. And that's what makes research accessible to classroom teachers and school leaders. So that's sort of thing number one, you know, not just quantitative research, but meaningful, accessible, qualitative studies um, with, spoken in the language of pedagogy. And then thing two, there's a big difference between the intentions of leaders, teachers, policymakers, suppliers, and the realities of how children are actually experiencing those learning experiences, those products, those devices. And at the moment, I would argue that too much research based on perceptions of how we think strategies, products and approaches are being experienced, rather than time taken to understand how children have internalised that experience and, and it shapes how they see themselves as a learner. And is that learner identity that will affect the child's trajectory more than any other factor, both in their current lesson, their year, the key stage school, but also as they move into further education, training, employment, their life as a global citizen. And that's the journey we really want children to be directed on, isn't it? Not just the here and now and the test, but that longer learning um, piece. OK, thank you very much, Fiona. Uh, Dan, final word for you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, David. Um, I, I think we would support anything that um, allows schools to be informed consumers in this space so i think it's it's what vivek was saying about training and partnerships with commercial providers is absolutely crucial so that schools understand what they're buying they understand what's in the market and then they understand what to use it how to use it once they uh, once they've got it so we would support anything that um that 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 supported schools in their purchasing decisions in that way um, so thank you. And I just wanted to say, David, just a, just a big thank you to you and all of your team for bringing this together. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to be a part of and, and it's been great to be on this panel with everyone else here. So thank you. Dan, thank you very much indeed. We're, we're really um, grateful to the Publishers Association for supporting uh, the, the three events. Uh, very grateful to all of those who have joined today and put questions to us. Particularly grateful to all of our panellists who have joined from their day jobs to uh, take part in this and give give us the benefit of their experience. And we will be pulling together uh, some of the conclusions and references from the last uh, three sessions and publishing them at some stage over the next few weeks. So please do look out for that um, via our website and, and probably by the, via the Publishers Association as well. But thank you all very much indeed for taking part today. 
uh, and we look forward to that publication and being able to follow up on some of the discussions uh, that we've had over the last few weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.